move right along. Uh, Dr. Brett Blau is going to speak to us about some alternatives <laughs> to Lors Van. Uh, so you have a laser pointer here. If you does this one also work? that one works, but just make sure you. I got to stand by the for the recording. Oh, the recording. No, nah, that's all right. All right. A couple minutes early. Um, but yeah, I got a lot to cover. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm Brett Blau, uh, the peach entomologist at uh, University of Georgia, as well as, as Cle Clemson University. And as you probably know, uh, Lore's ban has been banned. Uh, we can jump, jump ahead. Uh, so as of March 1st of this past year, all tolerances of Laura's ban have been revoked for use on food products. Um, so this this came, it's not as a big shock because um, it's been on the chopping block for a long time, but at the same time, it's it's pretty disappointing because it, it's been a pretty versatile tool um, and we've lost a, a big, a big uh, tool in our toolbox. But hopefully today we can talk about uh, there are alternatives, and so it's not all doom and gloom. There is hope. We have things that are in the pipeline that uh, hopefully will will take care of our, our that loss of that chlorpyrifos. Um, one one note about um, the ban is that it's, it is banned for food products, but if you have non-bearing trees, you can still use chlorpyrifos as long as that that tree or or bush will not bear fruit within one year. All right, so it's, it that doesn't help us too much, but it does give a little bit for for, for young trees that are not bearing. All right, so with the loss of chlorpyrifos, this will probably change a lot of our, our management programs, right? Uh, it is a big, big tool for both San Jose scale and our delayed dormant timings, as well as management for uh, peach tree bore and lesser peach tree bore. So with scale, you know, I've talked many times about delayed dormant applications. You can add in uh, insect growth regulators like Centaur and Esteem, and th those can really help improve uh, management of scale along with those, those dormant oil applications. So we still have those, and they still work well, but as if you've ever used those, you know that they are much more expensive than chlorpyrifos. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple other options we have chemically as well as uh, mating disruption and um, uh, uh, within season oil applications for that. Then borers are the other main main pest that we are using chlorpyrifos for. There are several other chemical options that I'm going to I'm going to discuss. We, we just started doing some um, spray trials, looking at things that might replace chlorpyrifos. So I'm going to update you all on that, and then update you on mating disruption and entomopathogenic nematodes to give you. Uh, some alternative methods to those chemistries. All right, so San Jose scale, um, I'm just going to briefly go over what they are because it, it's something that I've talked about a lot. Uh, it's one of our, our, our major pests in the southeast. Uh, it, it's really hard to kill because even though these, these females and these males are tiny little guys that really don't do much, then they're, the, especially, especially the females, they're basically just blobs. They're really easy to kill except that they produce this waxy coating that protects them for virtually from all of our insecticides. And so killing them has been a huge pain, I'm sure for you, but as well as me as a researcher, I just like, I just want to palm my head being like, how can we kill these things? Um, now the problem is that their, their populations, even if we don't kill them all, having just a few of them, a single female can uh, end up having 200 offspring in her life cycle which is basically a whole season. Um, so one female can become 200. Those 200 can then uh, exponentially grow into thousands over a season. And over years, you just get tons of scale that can eventually cause issues to the fruit, but also issues to the trees. Um, and this is really what we're concerned with, is, is seeing that die back from, from scale that have not been managed. All right, so hopefully you don't see too much of this. But um, in some of my research sites where we, where we are trying to kill the trees, uh, the scale can do a good job. All right, this is just a close-up showing what, the, what a nice branch should look like versus what we see is one that is just covered in scale. All right, so looking at what other chemical op options we have, 
Uh, we have a, a trial that we did last year at Fort Valley State on these uh, Scarlet Prince trees. We did uh, treatments that were repl replicated four times. Um, and then compared to uh, uh, untreated control. So we didn't do any sort of oil, uh, oil uh, applications. It was just we let these trees grow and, and get eaten by scale. All right, so we tested um, uh, two different oils. One was uh, dam oil at 1.5% and dam oil at 3% to see if we, uh, if we double our normal rate of 1.5% to 3, do we get any, any benefit from that increase in oil use? Then we're looking at another oil, the trace oil. We looked at that at three different rates, 1%, 2%, and 4%. And then carbaryl, which I've had some success in the past with San Jose scale. So we're looking at that again to see if I, we can still get that, that use. And the key here is the carbaryl is that it's at a pH of 6. Uh, pH for carbaryl is very important. At, at a pH of 6, it does have a longer residual. And that's what we really need for the San Jose scale at that delayed dormant timing is that we need that, that product to last long enough so once those scale emerge from their, their little shells that they get in contact with the uh, insecticide and die. And so a pH of six, um, studies have showed that, that that residual can be several months. Um, and then just to see what happens if we mix that carbaryl with oil, we had that treatment, and then venerate, which is a, a softer material see how that works with oil as well. I've looked at this several times, and it, it is um, uh, an effective treatment, but we wanted to compare them to these other ones. All right, so these are all the delayed dormant timing uh, applied in February. And then, um, because sometimes we just you know, cannot get out and get an insecticide out there during delayed dormant, uh, we can also target the, the crawlers. So we're looking at Venerate again at targeting the crawlers. We apply that two times. Um, over two weeks, April 19th and April 26th. Then we went back to the history books. So lime sulfur used to be one of the main insecticides used for San Jose scale. Unfortunately, it was also the first one to uh, where the in insect developed resistance. Um, but that was over 100 years ago. So we're like, well, you know, maybe we could try it again. Um, so we did, just for, just for fun. We tried lime sulfur and then at 10 gallons per acre. And then with a reduced rate uh, mixed with oil, because lime sulfur can be phytotoxic, we didn't want to burn, burn these trees, so we reduced the rate when we added it with oil. Um, and then Movento, which is one of our standard uh, within season insecticides that, has, that works really well. All right, so um, if you've never seen this talk before, basically we monitor the crawlers. So those are the immature stages of San Jose scale. Uh, they crawl along the tree and they get stuck on these black, uh, or it's on this double-sided tape here, but they get stuck on this double-sided tape. I can cut that tape off the tree, bring it into the lab, and count all these crawlers. So this is something we don't want to see. This is, this is from a control from several years ago, um, but we're able to then count all these crawlers and, and, and uh, um, assess whether or not those insecticides have worked. All right, so when we're looking at our delayed dormant applications, we have our untreated control here, which had about an average of almost 50 of those little crawlers per tape. All right, so just 50 of those little yellow dots on those tapes over the season. When we look at all our treatments, they're all significantly lower than our untreated control. So that's good, all right? All, all the treatments that we did actually reduced the number of scale, um, which, is, which is good. <laughs> We're killing them, that's great. Um, but what's, what's interesting is there's really not a big difference among, amongst those treatments there. The best ones we were seeing were that the, the dam oil at 3%, but everything statistically, um, except for the dam oil and uh, this trace oil at, oh, sorry, can see uh, at 1%, and the venerate plus oil, those are the only ones that were statistically significant from one another. But in terms of real life, all these treatments help reduce the number of crawlers which is, is good in my book. When we add in those, uh, uh, targeting those, the, the crawlers, um, we're seeing that, unfortunately, this, this venerate, which worked at the delayed dormant timing, when we were targeting those crawlers, we're not getting as much, much control there, um, which is unfortunate, because I've seen it work in the past, so it seems like some years it works and some years it doesn't. Um, but at the delayed dormant timing, we're getting good, good control. 
And then lime sulfur, which was exciting, it, um, lime sulfur also seems to be reducing those, those San Jose scales. So it appears that the populations that we have now are no longer resistant to lime sulfur. I know lime sulfur has its own issues, um, but just to, just to test it, this is, this is really cool. But when you add it with that oil, we don't get the, quite as much control. It's still not significant from lime, the lime sulfur alone, but that 10 gallons per acre versus that three gallons per acre plus oil, that doesn't seem to be working as well. And then Movento, which is one of our standards, still, still seems to be working well compared to all those. It, the Movento um, and dam oil at 3% were our, our best uh, treatments here. All right, oh, and last thing to note um, is that in 2022, we had, a, at least in Georgia, a huge population crash in our San Jose scale. Uh, so looking at our control, about an average of 50 per tape in a, a, a normal quote unquote year, we're gonna have about 250 to maybe 500 crawlers on average for our untreated control. So it's a huge drop. And so we saw this throughout, which I'll talk about some of our other treatments in a second, but just note that this is, last year was a really low year, um, which is good in general, but it just take that in, into, into consideration. All right, so next, we decided to look at mating disruption. I've talked about this a few years, um, but we're getting close and getting some really, excuse me, really good results. So all this is still experimental, but it's also very exciting. All right, so just a quick introduction into mating disruption. Um, so a lot of our insects, they communicate with pheromone. And one of the big, big ones is, is sex pheromone. So a female will release a pheromone. It basically produces a cloud or plume that floats through the air. Then the male can pick up on that pheromone and they do a little, little, this little flying thing uh, to figure out where that female is. Especially a lot of these small insects are just super tiny trying to find a female in this giant orchard. Um, they use that pheromone basically as a trail. So they can follow that, find the female, they mate, uh, produce babies. Those babies then go off and do their own thing and the cycle continues until we have a big problem. So what we can do is then put pheromone, put that synthetic sex pheromone, so we put these dispensers out in the orchards. All those dispensers release pheromone. The females that are out there are also releasing pheromone, but we create this huge cloud of pheromone. So when these males are trying to find that female, he keeps finding these different plumes of pheromone, and he can't figure out which one is the actual female. Uh, so there's a, there's a variety of ways this works out, but in, in the end it means the males can't mate with the females. If they don't mate, no eggs, no offspring. Um, hopefully, fewer, fewer scale. All right, so uh, this is probably the, the fifth year that I've tested this, but we're looking at different, different, um, different rates and different designs here. This is from 2021. We were looking at two different products, one from CBC America, which is an isomate. Um, which we put out in the orchard at 200 of these ties per acre. And then we compared that to a Trace product, uh, one uh, that we put out that's just kind of like this weird, uh, almost like a piece of tire, so rubber thing that we hung in the trees, one at 200 per acre and one at 100 per acre. And then 2022 changed a little bit. Uh, we still had that isomate design, uh, but then in two, or, sorry, in 2022, we looked at only 100 per acre, trying to reduce that rate, see whether or not it works. And then Trace A came back with a new design, which are these little puzzle pieces, which if they, they use these in other crops as well, but this is the first one for, for, um, uh, for San Jose scale. And we tried these at 50 per acre and also 100 per acre. We also monitored for the males. So these are pheromone baited traps and all these little dots are the San Jose scale males. Uh, so we have our, our, our 100 mating disruption. You can easily see there's a lot fewer males on those traps as compared to the control. And so what the trap is really showing us that if the pheromone is out there disrupting the males from finding the females, this means that if, they're, if they can't land on the trap, they're less likely to find the female as well. So what we're seeing here is that, yeah, we can actually reduce the number of males finding those females, in theory. Uh, we have our control here, which gets a super high population, but all three of our uh, main disruption treatments keep those males at low levels, 
It's all statistically significant. So fewer males finding fewer females should mean fewer crawlers, right? So that's what we looked at next. Yes, awesome. So in 2021, we had huge populations, average of almost uh, 350 crawlers per tape as compared to this year where we had about 60 or 50, um, a huge difference, but we were able to reduce those numbers um, to, to over half of the, uh, the control. So we're reducing those numbers uh, even to levels that are very similar to what we were seeing with our chemical treatments. 2022, we still much lower uh, numbers of San Jose scale on our untreated control, but still all of our treatments significantly or reduce the number of crawlers. So we're reducing the, the males that are finding those females, reducing the mating. And so over time, I would expect these, these peaks to keep dropping, dropping, and dropping. We'll probably never get to zero. Um, it's just with this kind of pest, that just is not a thing. Um, but if we can keep it below levels of, of damage, that's awesome in my book. All right. so. Mating disruption, no, is not for everyone. Um, and, and spraying um, some, some harsher chemicals isn't for everyone either. So we're looking at some within season management tactics. Um, one, we're testing eight different treatments uh, using these single trees replicated four times. Um, so in, in past, we've looked at this within season oil spray using low rates of oil, and it works really well. Um, but a few meetings ago, someone was like, well, how does it work with captain? It's like, oh, yeah, shoot, captain and oil don't mix. Uh, so we did a new, new trial saying, what happens if we do try this with captain and oil? Um, and one thing that did come out is sulfur still does not mix well. So keep that in mind. But the results from the captain actually look pretty good. So we're looking at captain on its own, which is I expect it not to do anything for scale, but just, just as a treatment. Then we're looking at Omni Supreme. Omni Supreme with Captain, Trace Oil, Trace Oil with Captain. Then we're looking at Sea Light, which is a diatomaceous earth, another uh, pretty soft material that we've had pretty good results in the past, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. All right, so again, we're having these low, low levels of scale. Captain didn't do anything for the scale, which is expected. But if we look at our oils, mixed oils alone and oils mixed with Captain, both of those treatments worked really well. We were able to reduce the number of scale. So we're not getting them to levels that we are seeing with mating disruption or with the chemical control, but this kind of technique is if we use it every year, again, we expect these peaks to go down and down and down over time. So it's not a one-time thing. It's gonna be a, 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 an almost an annual practice of using these low rates. Um, and one other thing to note is that um, in 2022, we tested this with Captain 4L at two quarts um, per acre. In 2021, I tested it with four quarts per acre with that Captain 4L, and we burned the leaves real bad. All right, so rates on the Captain is gonna be important. Uh, I went with the highest rate on the label, and that was wrong. Um, I should have gone with the label rate uh, in our guide, so the guide says two quarts, uh, and, that, and that worked well. All right, so keep that in mind that don't, don't try to go high. Okay, all right, so the summary really is that, um, I really wanna say is that uh, our, our dormant applications of oil, even though I didn't really talk about it today, are still critical. Uh, if you remember from the very first uh, trial, that 3% and that 1.5% of the dam oil, as well as the, the, the trace oil, still really kept those populations low. And that's really important to even on years where we're gonna have low numbers of scale. Because we don't really know which years are gonna have low numbers, right? It's not something I can predict, unfortunately. So we wanna make sure that we keep those oil applications going, because on the years, especially when it's low population, it really keeps those levels lower, and hopefully we can keep them, keep them low um, year after year after year. But if that doesn't happen, we can include uh, additional insecticides, uh, especially at a delayed dormant. So we have the Esteem and Centaur, which are the uh, insect growth regulators, uh, venerate, and then maybe carbaryl. Carbaryl seems, I've had two years of success with carbaryl, it seems to work really well for, for scale at delayed dormant. Now for targeting those crawlers, Movento, make sure that we have plenty of, of new leaves, new growth on those trees, and it can be taken up and work systemically, works really well. Uh, but it might be something to look at is lime sulfur. Um, I've had, uh, this, this year was really successful, but again, it was at low populations, 
So I'm going to need another year to make sure the Lime Sulfur is, is, is a one that I can recommend. Mating disruption is still in experimental stage, um, but the past two years with the, with the new formulations that they have have been working really well. Uh, so that's something that I'm really excited about and see how that progresses into the future. And then with those within season sprays of low rate, so about half percent or one percent of oil uh, over several, several applications with that, in that season do, does seem to have an impact on the scale. Uh, we just have to make sure that uh, we're keeping those, those captain rates low so we're not burning, the, burning those trees. All right, so that's scale. Borers. Borers, it's, um, chlorpyrifos was really the, the, the chemical that we used for borers. So the loss of chlorpyrifos was pretty scary for me, especially when I was thinking about borers. But then talking with uh, some of my colleagues, it's like, no, we actually do have um, some alternatives. So I, I'm hopefully this, this won't be too, too scary to you. Um, so I, this past fall, I, I did tested my first um, spray spray trial for, for borers. I don't have, the, obviously because I need to get the comeback this spring and, and see all the damage to get that, that full effect. So this is going to be kind of preliminary, but it's still, I think, really encouraging. All right, so we tested these uh, the seven different uh, compounds against borers, applied them with a handgun. Um, last September, we were looking at um, Asale, Asana, Altacore, Ryman, Mustang Max, Cormoran and uh, Lohr's ban as our kind of our, our positive control there, seeing how, how these all work compared to our previous Lohr's ban. I went back, um, even though I applied it in September, I went back last fall just to check to see if there was any new damage on those trees, which there were. Um, so I got a little bit of damage uh, data from last year, but uh, the, the, more, the more data will come this, this spring so we have a better understanding of really how this works. Uh, but what was really encouraging is that all of them did have significantly fewer um, new wounds compared to our untreated control. All right, so all these worked well. And actually, they're pretty much, if it's not statistically significant, but they're working as well as Lohr's ban, at least within, within that fall period. So I, I, I can't come out and say, yeah, these are all great, um, but they are encouraging. Okay, and so come back um, next year. Um, and I'll have a, a better, better, better data for you with more encouraging results. Ho hopefully, knock, knock on wood. All right. So there's two other other main uh, management alternatives that we have for the bores. The first one is going to be entopathogenic entop nematodes. Um, so this is some work that has been done by David Shapiro Alan at the USDA. I know he's talked about this quite a bit, and I've talked about it before. Um, but it does, it's very encouraging results, and they're getting to a point where it's also uh, economical, which is, which is awesome. All right, so when we're talking about entomopathogenic nematodes, sorry, um, we're talking about the good nematodes. These are the ones that they don't attack the plants at all. Now, we, we deal with uh, the, the parasitic nematodes as well, but these ones are beneficial. They actually attack other insects, and, other, and, and some of them will attack other uh, uh, parasitic nematodes as well. So these, these are the good nematodes. We call them the EPNs. All right. We have several different species of EPNs are commercially available, but the one we are looking at here specifically is the Steiner Nema carpocapsi. Um, there's two main ones you can get uh, from BASF is Nemesis C, and then BioB makes BioSC. Um, these, what's great about them is they can be applied with our standard equipment. We can use um, the same trunk, oops, sp trunk sprayers we use for Laura's band, we can use that for um, our nematodes. We can use a, a backpack sprayer, um, to handgun, whatever, it, it, it will work. Um, and if you were here for yesterday with the um, Plum Curculio talk, they were using a weed, uh, or sorry, um, um, an herbicide sprayer uh, to apply nematodes, and that worked for them as well. All right, so uh, what's cool about nematodes is that you can apply them preventively as well as curatively. So if you add them in the fall, like we were doing with Laura's ban, um, this is the, this instead of like a rate of uh, fluid ounces or pounds per acre, it's actually a rate of the number of nematodes. So it's a rate of either half to a million nematodes per tree. And that's like a tiny little flake of the powder because there's microscopic little roundworms. 
Um, but you apply that um, at, at to the trees, at the base of the trees, and uh, from several years ago, 2019, the untreated control, uh, we are having almost a 50, 40 to 50 percent infestation, whereas with these EPNs, zero percent. There was no infestation from peach tree borer and the, uh, uh, any of the trees that were applied with the EPNs. You can also apply it as a curative in the spring if you come back and you notice that, okay, maybe my, my trunk sprays did not work and we're starting to get some damage. You see some of these new wounds. You can then go out and apply the, um, the nematodes. You, even if, especially on a small farm, if you go out and you see that, okay, it's not working, you can do spot treatments. You can apply it directly to those, those trunks. And what we're seeing here is our untreated control versus chlorpyrifos. The clear FOSS numerically reduced them, but it wasn't statistically significant from the control. But these are three different application methods for the nematodes, and all three of them worked at getting those nematodes into the tree to kill the larvae. Unfortunately, as with everything, there's always some sort of caveat, right? There's nothing, there's no silver bullet for any of these yet. Um, the, one for, the one caveat for EPNs is moisture. They are free living roundworms. They need moisture to survive. Without moisture, they're going to desiccate and die. If they de are dead, they, they can't, can't kill those, uh, those borers. Um, and so if you have irrigation, you're good. If you don't have irrigation, there are uh, alter alternatives you can use. There's this one that David has been testing. It's called Barricade. It's a fire retardant gel. You mix that in with your nematodes, and it will help keep them alive long enough to do uh, what they need to do for killing those borers. And what we see here is that chlorpyrifos on its own is good. Uh, the nematodes mixed with the barricade is good, but if you don't have irrigation, the nematodes without the barricade, uh, unfortunately, is no good. Uh, they just they dry out and they, they, they don't work. Um, so that is a big, big thing to note is that this does not work uh, if you don't have irrigation, especially in the southeast with, with our climate. Um, but the good thing is that the EPNs do kill peach tree borer and they do it really well. Uh, they, in, in a lot of his results, it's actually better than Lohr's ban overall. But with that caveat of, uh, um, of the, the soil moisture, you know, it is, it is a big drawback if you don't have irrigation. Um, and if you add in that barricade gel, that increases the price. Um, so it depends on, you know, with the cost benefit here. Uh, but the cool thing is it does work. Um, and if you're using just, uh, if you have irrigation, it is economical. It's under $15 per acre with the nematodes uh, for petri borers is pretty awesome. All right, so mating disruption. That's a, another alternative. Um, we already talked about this for San Jose scale. But the same kind of technique can be used for, for peach tree borer and lesser peach tree borer, right? So they're mating here. We don't want that. Get rid of that. All right, so what can, what can, this, what can mating disruption provide for us for, um, for lesser peach tree borer and peach tree borer? Is that we have a lure or a dispenser um, that works against both peach tree borer and lesser peach tree borer. The San Jose scale dispensers that we have or that, that we're testing right now are only for San Jose scale. This dispenser works for both, so you're getting two pests for one. Um, you kind of deploy them area-wide, so put them out in your orchard all over. And then what's great is that we have this one dispenser that lasts season long. And so I'll show you some of the um, data of, of the activity of these borers. And they are basically season long active. And so having these dispensers, you're getting that disruption season long as well. All right, so one thing, if, if you've ever used uh, mating disruption in the past, it might not have worked very well because the, the formulations for, um, at least with the isomate, it was a PTB dual. That works great up north. Uh, unfortunately, it just did not have the residual or the longevity needed for the southeast. But CBC America has worked uh, with Ted Cottrell over the years, and they have a new, relatively new, um, uh, pr product called Isomate LPTB Plus, and that is specially formulated for the Southeast. So we get that season long activity out of our dispenser. So that's crucial. This is what you want if you're in the Southeast. If you're in the upstate, uh, um, uh, more closer to the mountains, 
you can get by with the regular one, but if you're in the ridge or that, that latitude, uh, you're gonna want this LPDB plus. Also, Trace A is another, uh, another pheromone company, and they've been working on a new product. Um, so what's nice is that uh, there might be a little bit of competition to help bring down some of that cost. All right, so this is some results from Ted from 2021, looking at two different dispensers. The Isomate product, which is very similar in terms of the dispenser as what we saw with uh, the scale. And then also um, these, uh, these rubber uh, meso strips uh, that was very similar to what I tested for scale as well. He monitored the, the adults as well as uh, any damage to those trees. And here's what we're seeing. We're, we're monitoring those adults. For peach tree borer, you're getting activity pretty much all season long um, in, those, in those traps. Well, in the two here, we have isomate and the trace, they're overlapping, right? So it's basically the same line as the x-axis because those, those traps are basically shutting down any capture. The pheromone is, is distracting uh, the male moths so they can't find those traps, and so we're getting what we call trap shutdown. So that's a good sign. It means if they, if, we're, if they can't find the traps, hopefully they can't find the females as well. Very similar with uh, lesser petri boar, we get these very flat lines of, of moths in those traps. When we look at the damage, um, unfortunately we only have it for lesser petri boar for, for this. Um, we're seeing that both the isomate and the trace within that, that, that period significantly reduce the number of damage. And so just like what I mentioned with the San Jose scale, over time this, this, this damage is going to reduce as we are disrupting more and more of those moths. All right, so they can control both. Uh, so that's awesome. You can apply them early, uh, uh, early March um, or during, during pruning. So we get the crew out there pruning, put these up after pruning. Um, it's a simple, simple timing. Um, and it's actually looking at the data, it's probably the most effective method of control for peach tree borer and lesser peach tree borer. However, <laughs> like with everything, there are uh, drawbacks. Um, the pheromone is pest specific, it's only for borers. Um, so you're not gonna, it's not gonna work against OFM, it's not gonna work against Plum Perculio, it's not gonna get work against San Jose Scale, it's just for these borers, but it's still two pests with one dispenser. The biggest issue, uh, or there's two big, biggest issues in my opinion, one is the product cost is still, it's pretty high, um, about $75 an acre, uh, but again, you're getting two, two pests with one, with one thing, it's, it's, and it works really well. But then I think the biggest caveat is this last one, is that an area-wide approach is best. Um, I know a lot of growers here, your neighbors are right up against your orchards, and so if they're not using mating disruption, but you are, mated females from the other orchard can fly in and cause damage into your orchard. So you have to have an area-wide approach to make sure that all the moths within that area are um, disrupted from their mating. So if you have um, orchards that are secluded uh, and they're not near other people's orchards, these, this works great. Uh, but if you have neighbors and those neighbors are not willing to use mating disruption, then we have a problem. Um, so that's, that's where we're at right now. It still works really well in, those, in the correct situations, but like, like with everything else I've said, there are some caveats that, that, that make, it, make it tough. All right, so the summary, the, there are several uh, alternative, uh, chemical alternatives that might be beneficial, that, might, that seem to work. Um, I just need the, the rest of the data before I can really recommend those. Uh, the nematodes, especially for peach tree borer, can work really, really well as long as you have irrigation. Um, and then mating disruption works for both peach tree borer and lesser peach tree borer. Um, but again, you need to make sure that it's the whole area um, within, within uh, less than a mile, but that whole area under under disruption for it to work. Um, some some resources, the 2023 guides have been printed, and it will be posted online soon for a PDF. Uh, so look out for those. The UGA Peach blog um, still exists, and we update that with uh, pertinent information. Uh, we do not spam you with, with stuff that doesn't matter. It's all it's all important. Um, then, of course. I always have to plug this is the My IPM smartphone app. Uh, we had our, our annual meeting last October to uh, update that. So every year we update it. Uh, hopefully it's, 
improved and, and hopefully you guys enjoy it. Um, but check those out. And thanks to everyone who made this possible and sponsored the work. And we'll take any questions. Or, yep, yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of the products you mentioned as a dormant um, application with that would be with our last application of oil, do any of them show any activity on scale that are settled or is that just for crawlers that might be present? That's that's uh, I uh, I can't say for certain. Um, exactly how it's killing them, but my guess is that it's it's that that residual is staying on there, and killing the crawlers once they're present. Okay. And with mating disruption, you need an area wide. How far apart from a non-treated mile? So that, that that is one thing we we really need to look at in more detail. But that's kind of what we're looking at is is. Uh, Little, I think less than a mile is fine, but like more than half a mile would be my guess. Because the thing is, these moths can fly far, but the reason they're going to be flying far is for looking for a resource, which is either going to be a mate or food. And so if they're trying to find that, uh, if they can fly less than a mile to find it, that's ideal. Um, so it's, it's one of those things like we know that they can fly super far, but in reality, they probably don't. Which goes first? So, so in the, in this study, we didn't use any with it lime sulfur with this one. Um, we we mixed the oil. The oil treatment was mixed. Uh, so it was a one, it was a, a 1.5 percent oil mixed. That's as efficacious as the lime sulfur one and the oil. Right. So it was and it was not. So the lime sulfur alone was more efficacious than the mix. Right, right. Um, so, how long between and which should go first? That's a really good question. I, I do not know. Um, but that I'll put that on my, my list of things because that's, that's the next step. This was really just to try to see, does it work for scale? Um, and so now, it's, now that I've seen that it's worked, I need to figure out more of how we can use it to, to work. Yeah. Cost comparison between dress oil and damn oil. So they, um, from what I hear, they, they, our results show that they, they work well. As long as you're using the right rate, um, you can get, they're both are going to work against, against scale. Cost. Oh, cost. That I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know the cost of the oils. Um, but that's, that's a good point. Oh, Gre Gregory in the back can. I have trouble hearing you. The trace oil is about the ball. Thanks. Seventy-five dollars on the uh, mating disruption is that the same for the two products? Very good question. So the the trace a product is still an experimental. It is not commercial yet. I have no idea where they're going to price that. I, I assume they were going to try to go lower, but um, I have no idea. Is it available for trial? I, I would assume so. If um, uh, if we talk to their representative, um, with a lot of these experimental things, if, if we can show you guys that it works, uh, that makes them real happy. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Blau.